Yeah, and thanks a lot for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, as Chris says, it's really nice to sometimes get a bit out of the studio and uh, discover that you are, that you're not alone, uh, and there uh, are a lot of like-minded people. So thanks a lot to Emily and Sarah and the Lighthouse team for being so extremely well organized. Um, and um, however, if you can just dim the light just a bit, because I prepared a, a slide for you. It's a bit dense, but uh, it's still early in the morning, so I hope you will be able to, to follow through. Um, but the presentation is um, considered how ideas taken from soundscape and acosmetic composition may be adapted in the creation of game audio. The ideas presented are based on my work on Limbo and have been provoked by some contrasting Limbo reviews regarding whether or not the, the game has music, which I'll get right to. Limbo is devoid of a soundtrack. The music in Limbo is just phenomenal. There's no music in Limbo. The music is also great. Music is entirely absent. You'll hear some incredible music. <laughs> the absence of back background music is one of Limbo's greatest features. So presuming that the reviewers actually played the same game, the discrepancy between the judgments may be related to each reviewer's definition of music. But as a premise for this presentation, we need to, uh, uh, music will be considered as uh, organized sound uh, a definition originally coined by composer Edgar Varese. Defining music as organized sound challenges the traditional divide between music and sound design, ultimately nailed down by video games offering separate entire volume sliders for each category. I don't know if you know about that, but in many video games you can actually turn down the music or the dialogue or the sound effects. I think that would be horrible if you could do that in a, in a movie. And you definitely can't do it in limbo or anything that I do. Um, but you actually need to have like an official exemption in order to, to have that. Uh, but otherwise, I would be uh, kind of intrigued to ask Microsoft or whoever who uh, demands it you know, to, to pick out which part is music and which part is not. But anyway, for now, we need to accept that music can be much more than mere rhythm harmony and melody, but expands to embrace sound design and sound effects. A few other extracts from Limbo Reviews supports this viewpoint. Ambient noise instantly replaces a traditional soundtrack. The jarring bus sound effects of the stalking spider and the sounds of the forest rustling leaves and the waterfall rapids are the only musical elements that will accompany you on your journey. The game's world's ambient noise sets the mood better than most game soundtracks. If the purpose of a soundtrack is to bring about an emotional response in an audience, then Limbus succeeds as well as any I've ever heard, despite not having a single song to its name. Ambient and environmental noises are the featured artists of the show. And these comments leads us directly to a quick introduction to acosmetic music and soundscape composition. Acosmetic music builds on ideas from music concrete and exploits rather extreme sound processing techniques as a means for abstracting musical values from whatever sound materials. The concept of the acosmetic originally used by Pierre Schaeffer to describe a sound that is heard without its cause being visible was adopted and refined to concern music in which the listener can no longer recognize the sources of the sounds. Soundscape composition differs from acosmetic music by exploiting sounds for their inherent referential values in the forming of musical meaning. Canadian composer Barry Truax, who was one of the original members of the World Soundscape Project in the early 70s stated that, to distinguish soundscape composition from music concrete and acosmetic music, I've argued that the original sounds must stay recognizable and the listener's contextual and symbolic associations should be invoked for a piece to be a soundscape composition. And Truer continues. 
Electroacoustic music or acousmatic music recognizes the abstracted aspects of its language while acknowledging its movements towards some point of absolute abstractness, where soundscape composition begins in complete contextual immersion and moves towards the abstracted middle ground. In order to illustrate the difference, I'll play back two sound examples. Although both examples are based solely on the recording of traffic sound, the first composition inhabits the continuum between contextual immersion and that of the abstracted middle ground, while the second occupies that between the abstracted middle ground and absolute abstractness. More specifically, the first example, the commuter stream, moves between traffic and trafficness, whereas the second example, sleep driver, moves between trafficness and abstraction. Let's hear the first example, an extract from Barry Truax's uh, soundscape composition, The Commuter Stream. Now let's hear the second example, an extract from the, uh, my own acousmatic composition Sleep Driver that builds on the recording of traffic sounds that I did in London while I studied uh, electroacoustic composition there. between the two here. Adopting the actual musical terms in the discussion of game audio is rather problematic. For example, in the context of film sound, the term acousmatic has already come to denote sounds that emit from sound sources apparently lo located off screen, thereby deviating from the current interpretation of the term in relation to acousmatic music, in which it refers to sounds where sources can no longer be recognized by the listener. To overcome this problem, I've suggested a distinction between close and remote correspondence between image and sound. Here the image not only refers to on-screen actions, but to the entire represented world, uh, including what we imagine to uh, exist beyond the boundary of the screen. In short, while co close correspondence relates to the pole of contextual immersion, remote correspondence resembles that of absolute abstractness. 
The midfield between these outer poles provides the key to transcend sound effects and musical materials, ultimately making them carry out opposite functions. The following two examples demonstrate, demonstrates how sound effects and ambient noise, otherwise belonging to the diegetic space of the game, has been arranged to carry out musical functions. The first example, hotel sign, illustrates a gradual movement from close audiovisual correspondence towards the midfields, or speaking in soundscape terms, from contextual immersion towards the abstracted middle ground. <coughs> the gradual transition happens over a relatively short expanse um, of ground. What we experience is a seamless transition from bleak sound of rain mixed with the, busy, with the buzzing city sound to a sort of harmonized noise having an almost musical quality. The emergence of harmonized noise provides the foundation for introducing a somewhat melodic phrase based on similar materials. And before playing back the example, I would like to demonstrate the workings behind it, which is a somewhat backward process. First, I discovered the melodic sound by running a digitally manipulated sound through an antique wire recorder, which I've been using throughout the game in order to create the bleak sound world. First, let's hear the original sound. The same sound recorded on the wire recorder and then played back into the computer. Sounds a bit different. From this wire recording, I extracted two elements, namely the harmonized noise and the melodic phrase. Let's hear the harmonized noise. And then the melodic sound. And figuring that this somewhat poetic sound could be used or associated with the flickering hotel sign, I started to look for a way to make them sneak into the game or to prepare for their appearance. An obvious solution was to use actual buzzing of a city environment. So I went to an abandoned harbor late Sunday night and recorded the following sound. So playing back the actual example, it should be it demonstrated how the sound uh, soundscape gradually changes from realism towards a more abstracted soundscape as the protagonist, the boy, approaches the hotel sign. First, we hear the sound of rain only after which the city buzzing blends in. From the mix of rain and city buzzing, the harmonized noise emerges in this way, preparing for the melodic sound to appear. As the boy eventually switches off the power, the soundscape returns to its original point of departure, namely the pure sound of rain.
The second example features a large-scale transition from realism towards pure abstraction over the course of three rotating rooms. The destination uh, is an abstract drone accompaniment to a somewhat illusionary view of the boy's sister playing under the tree in the middle of a giant foundry. In the first rotating, uh, in the first rotating room, the aim was to create a big space by utilizing sound sources that were spontaneously associated with larger spaces. Besides actual foundry interiors, the sound of an orchestra was used. However, as an orchestra, by definition, is allowed to, um, to reside in the non-diegetic space of the game, we do rarely associate the space implied by an orchestra with that of the image. In order to utilize the orchestra for its inherent spatial properties, it was necessary to somewhat bring the sound into the image or the diegesis of the game. This was achieved by crossing the sound of the orchestra with that of the giant foundry by means of source and convolution filtering. First, let's hear the recording of, an, of a foundry. Then uh, the recording of an orchestra piece that I composed a long time ago. And then a spectral interpolation between this, the recording of the foundry and that of the orchestra. So that's kind of adding the two spectras together. retain the nuances of the, of the orchestra, but it's, it's not really there at the same time. The second rotating room features some additional challenges for the ball, including some circular souls calling for a more nasty and metallic soundscape. I found an old recording of a boat symbol containing both rough textures and haunting tones. While the roughness was used for representing the circular souls, the softer tones was used for a stinger that's triggered when the boy survives the source. First, let's hear the previous rotating room, once again, the example that you just heard. And now the original recording of a boat symbol. And then I do the same trick again by interpolating the, the two sounds, by kind of adding the, the spectras together, and it sounds like this. And finally, let's listen to the stinger that's triggered when the boy survives the sword, based solely on the symbol recording. So playing back the example, it should be clear how the game's soundscape gradually changes from realism towards pure abstraction. Unlike the former example, the transition back to realism happens gradually as a zombie snail attaches to the boy's head and forces him to walk in the opposite direction of his sister. What was silent before becomes once again a violent foundry.
so this uh, concludes the first part of the presentation. Are there any questions? I can't see anything from here. <laughs> I was curious about your process of spectral interpolation. I was wondering what that looked like and how you managed that. You were asking how I... Spectral interpolation you mentioned. I was mm. wondering what the process of that is. Yeah, I, I use uh, different tools like um, source uh, convolution uh, or source filtering, like uh, fast Fourier transform. And other times I use like plain uh, convolution uh, techniques. So it's really about analyzing both spectres and then adding them together. Actually. Hello. Um, do you find that electroacoustic music, which only has a very small audience compared to normal music, has found through film and game its real audience? Um, a larger audience? Like if it's helping to get more audiences, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, at least that's what I experience, you know, because truly in my earlier work on electroacoustic, like cosmetic music, you know, it's a, it's a much smaller audience. But when people play a game like this and get curious, then they start to research and then they end up uh, getting interested and, and listen to it. So I had. Uh, a lot of uh, emails and exactly that. So, yeah, so in a way, it could be a way of uh, promoting that kind of music. Um, yeah, in light of the last question, was there any pressure on Limbo or on your upcoming game to make the music a bit more conventional? Or maybe in Limbo, maybe, because it got published by different formats and things. If from the outside, I would <laughs> Yeah, uh, anybody that was involved in the production. I assume you have a very close relationship with developer so yeah but at any point was there or even did anybody feel that you needed no, to make there wasn't it more? any uh, yeah I was lucky enough to uh, you know just to do my thing and, and people were, were happy with that and that's still how it is today okay. um, but, but I think the important thing is that it is like a, a collaboration so it's not like I'm just making sound for what other people are doing it could also be something that is just a mock-up of, of something and then I imagine it to be something and I start to create sound uh, for that. And then uh, the art guy yeah, said, whoa, yeah. good, uh, great, we have to, to do something uh, yeah. about that. And, and sometimes it even gets in, into kind of battles. You know, I do something and they have to <laughs> do it better. And I try to do it better. And but I think really nice. the developer has quite open-minded kind of taste when it comes to music. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 OK, cheers. Thanks. Um, obviously, we're listening to it very nice sound system and we can hear everything and when people are playing the games I'm sure that the range of devices and the quality of the speakers that they're listening to are vast do you aim it at you just as, kind of assume that everyone should sort out their hi-fi and listen to it in the best possible way or do you have to take into account that someone's playing on a terrible laptop with little speakers as well yeah, there's that's, that's always a, a discussion, but I, I really decided to, uh, to not worry about it and to make it sound as good as I can for, for the people who actually uh, invest in, uh, in listening on, on, good, uh, on a good system. You know, I wouldn't really want to compromise uh, on that. You know, if you choose to play it on a, on a TV with uh, bad speakers or an iPhone or whatever, you know, it's your decision. Uh, so I would say it's kind of odd because when I play Limbo on, on an iPhone, I actually think it sounds good, you know, but maybe that's because it has this kind of bleak, bleak sound to it, you know, so it actually works on, on, on that device. But otherwise, I would just make sure, for example, in, in Limbo, there was uh, the, the spider. In the, in, the, in the beginning, I was just have some kind of rumble sound to, to represent it, but you couldn't hear that on small speakers, so I'd, I would start to distort the sound to get it a bit more uh, lighter uh, content in it so you can actually hear it. So if it's something that is, that is important to the gameplay, you know, for the, for the player to actually be able to, to play it and hear where the sounds are, I will kind of do something about it, but uh, I would never do it 
if it would compromise uh, the experience of uh, playing at it uh, on a good system. Uh, I've got one for you. Um, if you're a player and listen to the game rather than watch the game, do you think you could steer yourself through emotionally? Because you've got these changes when they're successful. So could you start to listen to how to solve the game? Mm, you mean like actually play the game without uh, viewing? Perhaps, but you know, there's always that sort of bit. But there, but there's, there's actually an uh, interesting section uh, which came with the PC and PS4 release, which is uh, called a dark room below uh, Limbo, and you need to have some kind of achievements to, to get down there. But it's actually played in totally uh, darkness, and you can only see the eyes blinking, but you can hear the kind of machine guns and all the kind of violent stuff happening, and you have to, to listen in order to, to get through. You have to uh, try it if you haven't tried it. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Um. Got time for just one more on bridge. Uh, hi, yeah. yeah, I was just wondering, with a lot of your work on Limbo and from what we've heard from inside as well, um, there's a lot of intentional degrading of the sound, a lot of sort of heavy compression and distortion, um, do you ever worry that there might be a point where, you, for the audience, you cross the line into them not realizing that that's intentional and crossing the line into just um, incorrect sound and, and where, the, where the line is between kind of that really nice, harsh, warm distortion and something just sounding like it's wrong? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I understand what, what you mean, but I, I don't worry too much about it because I only do it if I, if I love the sound, you know, of course, at some level, it's a, it's a concept, but if it doesn't sound right to me, then I, I don't care about the concept, if you see what I mean. So um, at the end, I will pick up the sounds that I think uh, work for the, for the game. And it's, it's true, uh, I did the same thing in, in Inside, but uh, it's totally different uh, hardware I'm using there. It's uh, mostly very bad uh, stuff from the 80s uh, to get this kind of grainy, simple sound. Okay, I think that's time we have. Um, that's all the time we have now. Um, just, just wanted to say thank you, Martin, and you. Um, particularly for sharing, you know, that that exclusive um, preview of Inside. I mean, I'm sure everyone will agree that was a great privilege. So, thank you very much. Thank you.